I think, but my mind is a, not as clear as it used to be, that uh, Gary and Keith and I met on the same day at Fermilab. Keith probably doesn't remember it that way, but I was, uh, um, even though I'm the same age as Keith, which always startles me, uh, <laughs> I was a young, very uh, raw graduate student, and I used to, uh, I met Keith probably at the Fermilab grill because you had a patty melt every single day that I was there. <laughs> he did. No cheese. Right, no cheese. Um, and the Fermilab grill is known for its, its fine food and, and cleanliness. So uh, I remember talking with them in Keith's office a lot. And Keith, this is to keep, I think he, you kept your dog under your desk to keep Bob away probably. <laughs> Uh, I remember that dog too. Keith that had a dog good. named Fang that slept on fog. 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 fog? I thought it was Fang. Fog. Okay, same thing. Um, and Gary loved dogs. As you, if you know Gary, you know Gary loved dogs. And I thought that was cool. Uh, just recently, Keith uh, won the Beta Prize for stuff that was near and dear, for working on things near and dear to Gary's heart. And uh, I know Gary would have been very proud of that. He partnered with Gary and the late Dave Schramm, who played a role in all of our lives to work on Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And I know Dave would be proud of you for winning that prize too. I think we all are. Uh, today he is going to tell us about Big Bang nucleosynthesis and his shared experiences with Gary. Thanks, Keith. Oh, here you go. So before So before I start, I just wanted to say now a couple things. The first one was actually something that, that Bob uh, uh, reminded me of and when Bob said that uh, Gary was responsible for his kids. Uh, maybe not the way it sounds, the way I just said it. <laughs> but uh, but uh, Gary was also responsible for my kids in a different way. Um, and not the way it sounds when I say it that way either. Uh, Gary, in 83, I was a postdoc at CERN, and Gary was supposed to come for a four-month visit. Uh, and he canceled. I'm not sure why he canceled, but he canceled, and they asked me, would I like to stay another four months? And those four months were critical for me because I met my wife. We were together you know, a few months at that point, but she certainly wasn't ready to commit to coming to the United States at that point, and the extra four months gave her the time to make up her mind and uh, and so we came back to the United States in uh, the end of June in 83 so without Gary I probably wouldn't have uh, married my wife and my kids wouldn't be here. Um, the dog, so uh, Terry just reminded me about the dogs. Uh, so yeah I had a not as big of dog as, as, uh, as Gary uh, but uh, Gary at one point, so Gary uh, got to stay in uh, housing at Aspen with his dog, which was usually pretty hard. And I think he stayed at Steve Gaziorowicz's uh, apartment um, during the summers. Uh, I didn't have that kind of connection, so I stayed in a campground every summer when I was at Aspen. Uh, and at Aspen, that was a little bit of a pain because you couldn't stay at a particular place for more than five days or seven days, and you had to keep moving every few days to a different campground. Um, but Gary one time went out of town and asked me if I could take care of Holly uh, and uh, boy, that was nice being in an apartment and having showers and everything like that. So I had my dog and, and Gary's dog at the same time. Uh, so I'm going to talk about our relation uh, concerning Big Bang nucleosynthesis uh, over the years. I'm going to start out with just a little bit of physics to put it in context and then talk about uh, Gary's, uh, some of Gary's work on nucleosynthesis before me uh, and some of it with me, and then some of the things that uh, we've done afterwards. So if everything works. don't have a lot of pictures of me and Gary. This is one from, uh, I believe it's 2006 in Germany. There was a meeting. It's a sort of nice picture of the two of us together. Uh, so about 11 years ago. So just to put things in perspective, um, and BBN's role in cosmology, uh, there's a very simple argument of how uh, Alpha Herman Gamow came up with the idea that there should be a microwave background. 
And uh, the argument is basically that in the context of Big Bang cosmology, uh, you had high temperatures, and they recognized that you needed to have nuclear reactions. You needed temperatures bigger than about 100 keV. Everything can be done with very, very rough numbers, which is what, what I think is so nice about just these few lines. And if you talk about back of the envelope, this, is, this would actually fit on the back of an envelope. They also knew, and that time scale in, in their model uh, of 100 keV was something like a few hundred seconds, a couple hundred seconds. They also knew what that cross-section for making deuterium was, so 5 times 10 to the minus 20 centimeters cubed per second. Again, you don't need more accuracy than that here. And then uh, you can then relate that uh, rate to a number density of baryons that you would have, and that's about 10 to the 17. You have the cross-section, you have the time scale, so you can get a density. 10 to the 17 per cubic centimeter. Then if you know something about the density of baryons today, that's about 10 to the minus 7, and you know that the baryon density scales is the temperature cubed, or 1 over the volume, you can then predict what the, baryon, what the temperature of background radiation is today, and you can get just from that about 10 seconds. Mike, it'll be on the web. <laughs> uh, so in the early universe, uh, when we talk about BBN uh, with relatively low temperatures by the scale of things that uh, people do today. We just need to go above about an MeV where we think we know what's going on. We need to know what the density, the energy density of the universe was, which is dominated by radiation, so we have contributions from photons, electrons, neutrinos. And we need to know something about the uh, baryon density. We use the fact that there's, uh, the weak interactions are in equilibrium. And we also know that the weak interactions fall out of equilibrium by comparing the weak interaction rate uh, and the uh, Hubble expansion rate. And those beta interactions will eventually freeze out. And you can then determine what the neutron to proton ratio is. And then you have to take into account free neutron decay. So sort of. N nucleus is a bit delayed. You first start by forming deuterium, but the problem is, is that it's uh, very easy to destroy deuterium, especially that there's a lot of photons running around. Remember, the photon to baryon density is about 10 to the 10, so you have to wait until you cool significantly below the uh, uh, MeV scale, which uh, corresponds to the deuterium binding energy. So you have to get down to where that's exponentially suppressed, and then you get uh, nucleosynthesis, nucleosynthesis to start when the, proton, the production and destruction rates for deuterium are about equal. And that happens at about a factor of 20 below the binding energy, so down to about a tenth of an MeV. And then you can make the assumption that all the neutrons present at the time end up in helium, and if you use that one-seventh, you get about 25 percent with a smattering of other things. And then you put all this together with the chain of nuclear reactions, you put it in a code, and you can make the prediction for what the light elements uh, should be. And uh, this is the helium abundance by mass, deuterium, helium-3, and lithium-7 abundances by number. A uh, couple things to look at here. Uh, one is the uh, range of the baryon density just in this plot, because you'll see similar plots in a few minutes. Um, and uh, this is already a much too large of a range to some extent because we know from the microwave background, oops, we know from the microwave background what that density should be. And as I'll discuss a little bit, that this is essentially now a parameter free theory. Uh, the baryon density, and if you want, when I talk about the work with Gary, we had three parameters. We had the number of neutrinos, we had the baryon density, and we had the neutron mean life. And now all of those are to. Uh, well enough prediction uh, uh, fixed, and so you can just uh, compute the uh, abundances of the light elements and compare them to observation. So I looked uh, where Gary's uh, introduction to nuclear synthesis uh, occurred, and uh, his first BBN-related work was in 1976, Rude, Steigman, and Tinsley. Uh, it's not directly nuclear synthesis, but it was relevant because they they were looking at the uh, production of helium-3 in stars. And it's uh, really amazing that this, this work uh, uh, is still quite valid today. Uh, the problem with helium-3, in fact, uh, as you see, we don't usually use helium-3 uh, for constraints on BBN, precisely because of the issues that they raised in this paper. 
is helium-3 is, is made in stars and it's destroyed in stars and unless you know very accurately the history of star formation in the galaxy or wherever it is that you're observing helium-3, uh, it's very hard to go back and use helium-3 uh, as a primordial tracer. Uh, and so there's a paragraph in that paper where they're actually thinking about the sum of deuterium and helium-3 and that's something that we used later on uh, for constraints uh, on BBN and I think this is the origin of that argument coming from Gary's work in 76. Uh, I threw this in so I, I was a, a little bit surprised also to see uh, so Gary had already worked on boron abundances in 76. Now boron doesn't relate directly to BBN but it is something that relates to nucleosynthesis and something that Gary uh, worked on uh, from time to time as well. Um, that, is co that is cosmic ray induced nucleosynthesis. So uh, the uh, Lebeb elements, lithium, beryllium, and boron, uh, weren't formed in the Big Bang. Well, lithium, of course, was, but some of lithium, uh, some of the later lithium is made in cosmic ray interactions. And that's uh, something that uh, we tried to tie together with BBN, and that Gary started this work in 76, and I worked on it with him and with Terry. Uh, in later years looking at the abundances of these elements which are observed in the same stars that lithium is observed so there was some connection there as well. Uh, then I think we get still in 76 so that was a, a big year for Gary. Uh, we have the paper that uh, Gary did with uh, Dave Schramm and Jim Gunn. Uh, I think really important paper. Uh, I think sort of really at the beginning of uh, what we call now astroparticle physics because this really was starting to use cosmology to uh, probe uh, particle physics models and here what they were trying to do was set a limit on the number of neutrino flavors. I mean they, they're calling them, oops, wrong one, uh, they're trying to set limits on mass of leptons. So uh, they were just assuming that the extra neutrinos would be heavy. Uh, of course they didn't need to be in, in the argument that they were using but uh, and they set a limit uh, that the number of extra, extra heavy neutrino types or lepton types would be less than or equal to five. At the time they knew of two, uh, so that was seven. Uh, what was interesting is why uh, one of the arguments that they gave why this was so important, uh, they had an argument based on, this is taken from the paper, a paragraph somewhere in the paper, uh, they had an argument that uh, it'd really be good to be able to set the limit less than eight because they had the idea that, well, uh, asymptotic freedom won't hold if I can uh, won't hold if there are more than 16 quark color triplets and then they said well if if each neutrino comes uh, together as a pair of these things and we know that there are less than eight uh, if we can set a limit that's less than eight that that would be very interesting and and so I think they were pleased that they could get the limit less than seven at the time um, so this was a very influential paper uh, uh, and uh, I think influenced their own work and then certainly uh, everybody's in the work, everybody in the field's work after that. Uh, some things in the paper, so main argument in the paper is using this relation gamma equals h, the freeze out condition, so some interaction rate uh, taking place in the early universe compared with the expansion rate in the early universe. That's really how all of these constraints uh, get applied to physics beyond the standard model or standard model limits. Uh, when applied to the early universe. And so the idea here was you're doing something to the early universe which affects an interaction rate or the expansion rate and that will change the uh, epoch of freeze out and that will eventually change the abundance of the light elements and in particular the neutron to proton ratio which I mentioned and then of course then the helium abundance. And so they have an expression here for the helium abundance by mass and here H don't get confused. H here is not the Hubble parameter. H is actually what we call eta now. I don't know, they were Americanizing the, uh, the Greek symbol or we Greek Greekized the uh, American symbol, but this is the uh, baryon to photon ratio and then uh, the symbol that Gary liked to use for the speed up, uh, xi, which is just related to the uh, change in the energy density relative to the standard one. So uh, this would be one for standard model and then anything you add to that like the number of uh, uh, neutrino flavors would increase psi, increase the expansion rate, change freeze out, and eventually change the helium abundance. Uh, and 
you notice, so this is the only papers they refer to for BBN were the really, uh, I would say, pre-modern ones. So uh, Wagner, Fowler, and Hoyle, 67, Peebles, 66, and Wagner, 73. So uh, there weren't any of their own papers to refer to at the time because really this was their first, their first uh, uh, one on the subject. Paper that was really important for me uh, was this one. They were just finishing this up uh, when I started uh, uh, doing at graduate school with Dave Schramm uh, as my advisor. So I started in the, in the fall or, or late summer of 78. So they were just finishing this paper, uh, Constraints on Cosmology, Neutrino Physics, and Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. So this is the one that Dave gave me to read. Uh, to understand and uh, to start working on the project that he and Gary were next doing. Uh, so, as I say, this was, this was my Bible for BBN uh, when I was starting out uh, in 78. And, um, let me see to keep track. So, here is a plot from that, from that paper. And if you look at the top, the scale, so baryon density, you know, they were really generous in what the baryon density is. You see uh, the plot I showed a little bit earlier concentrated around one decade, around 10 to the minus 2. And here you've got some four decades in, in the baryon density showing the abundances, uh, in this case, mass fractions for all of the light elements, including lithium-6 and boron-11 there. So a big range, a lot of uncertainties. Uh, and here you see also that they're considering what happens if you add five new neutrino types. Right? So what are the effects on the abundances with five new neutrino types? Uh, a couple of other plots from that figure, blow up of the helium abundance, uh, showing what happens when you have, again, five, uh, uh, five new neutrinos and how it depends on the neutrino abundance. No, uh, sorry, how the helium abundance depends on the number of neutrinos, the deuterium abundance. And then I think one for the lithium abundance as well. Usually we don't think about that as being very constraining, but uh, there is a, a dependence uh, as well there. So, uh, oh, and then they went on and did other things like constrained beyond the standard model physics. So here was uh, looking at what happens if you change the uh, uh, Newton's constant, if Newton's constant varied with time. Uh, how that would affect the helium abundance. And again, it goes back to that relation gamma equals h. Uh, again, if you change uh, Newton's constant, you're going to change the expansion rate of the universe. And so you can play the same, same games in that sense. Uh, the first thing that I could find that uh, had both mine and Gary's name on it was uh, a, 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 an abstract from uh, an AAS meeting. I think Gary must have submitted this because I don't remember being at this thing. but. Uh, it's a while ago, so maybe. Uh, but this was on that project, the first project that I started to work on with, uh, with Dave and Gary uh, on constraining other types of weakly interacting particles, in particular particles that were more weakly interacting than neutrinos. And um, so I, I don't know if this says more about Gary or than me, but I have all the old correspondence that I had with Gary. Uh, you see this one, first of all, it was very early on for me, October 78, and he's writing to, uh, to, uh, to Dave about this project uh, that, uh, that Dave had me then working on. And you see, uh, there was no email in those times, so uh, there was no other real way we could communicate by phone, uh, but that was expensive because those were long-distance calls, and that mattered. So uh, the other way of communicating was writing a letter, putting it in the mail, and getting it, and, uh, uh, and going through it, and then, OK, that's what you have. Um, so this was, uh, actually, this, uh, this yeah. pertains to the, to the question that Mike was just asking. Uh, what are the number of degrees of freedom as a function of temperature? And so that was what we had to worry about. If a particle interacted more weakly than neutrinos, it would decouple more weakly, and then you needed to know the number of light degrees, number of, uh, light degrees of freedom that were present at a given temperature. And so uh, Gary was writing in this letter to Dave. Uh, I think he knew that I was working on the problem that, that, he, that, that, uh, that Dave had. Uh, he didn't actually know that I was a student at the time. So I met Gary a couple of months after this letter in December 78. Mike jog jogged my memory. We went to a meeting in Madison um, on uh, Grand Unification. And uh, 
Uh, Gary didn't know I was a student. He thought I was Dave's postdoc at the time, but uh, I don't know if he was happy or not happy about it. But uh, uh, here is a letter. Th this is just three days later. So Gary's thinking about this, and he sends another letter to Dave. Uh, so this is a footnote to what I just sent you with some more details. And so Gary was definitely very involved, uh, as you can see. And then the rest of the letter is there. Um, on the details on how these things should be calculated. So it goes back to, to 78. Uh, well, by March, or the paper wasn't quite finished, by March I was included in the letter, so dear Dave and Keith. Uh, uh, and this is funny for me for a few reasons. Sorry for the delay in preparing the draft version. Feel free to make any changes. This is very unlike Gary, the feel free about making any changes. Gary was very particular in how he wanted things written. And, uh, Usually any changes we would make would get unmade by him later. But that's, and I think I, see, I never cared about these kind of details. So I was not the referee of the paper you were talking about, because I certainly wouldn't have cared about the punctuation. <laughs> uh, and so I, basically it never caused a conflict between me and, 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 uh, and uh, Gary, because he would, do what, he would write it in the way he wanted, and that was fine with me. I mean, I just wanted the equations to be right. and the. the the, the basic idea to be right, but Gary was a little bit particular about all of that. So, um, and then it was amusing to me because uh, I had this Gary's. Why not put you know put uh, this in the same graph? And so I, I said sure uh, on my copy of the letter. And then the paper finally did come out shortly after that. We I guess we submitted it in May of '79. So this was my first real work with Gary on. <laughs> Cosmological constraints. We really debated about the, the title, whether to call it super weak, because super weak interactions had different meaning at the time, and we were play, playing around with the idea of hyper weak, but eventually we went back to super weak. Uh, and uh, that was what we did then. And there was the table, which was, uh, I think, very useful at the time. And here you see the limit on the number of neutrino flavors depending on when they decoupled based on uh, what particles were around at the time. I think I have a hand-drawn version, a hand-written uh, version of this that's coming up in just a second that I think is mostly done by Gary. By 1980, so we were working on a longer version of this paper. So that, that was a letter which had just the bare, uh, bare basic idea and calculations. And by uh, 1980, he's just writing to me. Dave was out of the loop, I guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, so. Uh, I'll let, you handle, I'll let you handle the preprints and send you a copy of my mailing labels. Please send uh, all this stuff that you don't even think about anymore, but this was part of you know, what was important at the time to put in a letter. Um, uh, and, uh, and he wants copies of the figures so he can make transparencies. So there was no way of getting digital versions of these things to him. Um, uh, Barthol will let Chicago pay the publication costs, and we have to order 150 additional reprints for bureaucratic purposes. So again, all these things that um, are sort of gone by the wayside now. Uh, he's, I hope the references are complete. Here was another one he wanted added. Um, so this was, uh, again, from this is that table. So this is Gary. And you can see real evidence of cut and paste here. So I don't know if you can tell that that was he didn't want to scratch it out. There's some scratch out up there, but this was actually cutting and pasting uh, that label on there. Uh, and I think that's me writing in the caption at the top. So I scratched out. You see, Gary's nice and neat. He goes and cuts out a little thing and tapes it on. I just scratch it out. Um, another. So here's this is, was an amusing one when I ran across this a few weeks ago. Um, he said, Santa Cruz workshop, I received the uh, enclosed request for preprints. I must have given away all my copies. Can you fill out the request and send me about 10 copies? Uh, by the way, whatever happened to the paper? Did, did Dave call Klein, and has the paper been sent to nuclear physics? So the paper was, was sent to FizRev D at the time. It was rejected. Uh, basically, it was said, well, you already have a letter. What do you need this big paper for with all these calculations? We put in all the resonances. We did all the, I did all this work. And the referee says, yeah, but there could be other ones. There are all the charm baryons you didn't include. They're all, and of course, they don't make any difference. But uh, we went through a couple rounds with the referee. And uh, we, Dave said, well, I'll, I'll call Dave Klein, and we'll send it to nuclear physics. And, and I think it got accepted immediately. And I think that, so that's the next slide. So that was this paper that, that got done in 1980. 
Everything took more time in those days, as you can see. There's just no way you just, you know, you don't send off an email, send a copy of the tech file, do a quick, all this took time. It was in the mail, uh, occasional phone call, uh, and that was it. And these were the, the figures. This is actually, I think, the thing that you were asking John uh, about the number of degrees of freedom as a function of temperature, and so this is what we had in 1980. Surprisingly, it hasn't changed that much. Um, there is a, a new figure like this done by Ringwald and, uh, and some of his co-authors, which they've asked us to use in the review of particle physics. So you, either you look at the Ringwald paper or our version of, of their paper. It's actually some surprisingly similar. Of course, right around this part is where it's going to be a little bit different, but before and after. And where the lattice, it has nothing to do with analytic calculations. They can actually measure uh, the energy density on the lattice. Right. Not right away, but it's, it's, take a look at it. It's surprisingly similar, uh, it's, uh, which I think w helped me uh, be so eager to just use what they have now and, and get it to be modern. Uh, so th this was then uh, my first real BBN paper with Gary. The other one was, again, constraints on astroparticle physics, extra, extra degrees of freedom. But here we went back. Uh, and actually uh, worked on nucleosynthesis per se. So this is uh, shortly after that. This is again uh, 1980. I guess we were doing it simultaneously. Uh, and this you see involves uh, uh, Dave, Gary, Mike, and Youngman Yang, who was on that first paper that I mentioned uh, with with Bob Rood. And here it was we were really talking about the three parameters that that we had in nucleosynthesis: the number of neutrino flavors, which we didn't know. Uh, the baryon density, of course, which we didn't know, and the neutron mean life, which I'll come back to in a second. But uh, again, that was so uncertain at the time that that actually played a role in, in what we were thinking. Um, uh, and then a few years later, uh, and this paper also took quite a while to come out, uh, was sparked by the uh, actual observations of the lithium abundance. Uh, so just uh, reverse, we reversed the order, uh, author order. Uh, so this little first one was Asti, and this one was Yitzo. Uh, and uh, so there was more information in this a few years ago, particularly the lithium abundances. Uh, but also uh, neutron mean lives were also now starting to come under control. Uh, and here's uh, a plot of the neutron mean life as a function of uh, time, in some sense. Uh, measurements uh, in the 60s and 70s were sort of all over the place. Uh, I remember there was a, a Russian measurement uh, sort of around this period that nobody believed, at least the review of particle physics didn't believe it until a French measurement sort of confirmed it, and then there was a quantum jump in that uh, mean life, and then it's really sort of stabilized. There's another little quantum jump here, which uh, is still being debated, but uh, that's at least the, the world average coming from the review of particle physics uh, for the neutron mean life. So that's been settled, more or less. Uh, and that's how it shows how the neutron mean life affects uh, the uh, helium mass fraction. Um, well, a uh, few years later, this is now 1991, uh, or 1990, we were doing the work uh, now involving uh, uh, Terry and uh, Ho Hoshi Kang, who was, I guess, a student here at the time. He was Gary's student. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, this was, again, a, a, for us, a, a sort of a big overhaul of uh, how we treated nucleosynthesis. And then uh, Gary, Terry, and I, uh, 10 years later, uh, did another overhaul. This was more of a review. Uh, this was in a volume for, um, in, in memory of Dave Schramm, who uh, died in, in 1997, almost 20 years ago uh, today. Uh, so. Nucleosynthesis, um, how, do we, uh, how do we treat it? Uh, it predicts the light elements, as I said, deuterium, helium-3, helium-4, lithium. Um, as I said, the helium-4 abundance is roughly 25% by mass. It's observed in extragalactic H2 regions. Lithium uh, is about 10 to the minus 10 in halo dwarf stars. Deuterium, now best measured in quasar absorption systems. There are other measurements, but the ones you can trace back to the Big Bang are from these quasar absorption systems at the level of a few times 10 to the minus 5. And then the helium-3, sort of in solar wind, meteorites, the interstellar medium, it's also around 10 to the minus 5, which is about the BBN value. But again, going back to that 76 paper of, of Gary, 
Uh, it's not clear how you attach any of the measurements to the BBN. So just to give you sort of a view of how things stand now, um, deuterium has really gone through a big overhaul in the last few years. Uh, a lot of the work is done by um, Ryan Cook and, uh, and Max Patini. There are others as well, but they've really uh, claim to get the errors down on this deuterium abundance to effectively the percent level. I think their last paper said deuterium abundance at 1%. Um, and uh, better than that, I mean, there's really a lot of coherence. Uh, this, these are the measurements, the uh, recent measurements of the BBN abundance, sorry, of the deuterium abundance in these quasar absorption systems. And, uh, you know, the, weight, the weighted mean is there. Um, and you can see the comparison between the observed average, uh, 2.55 plus or minus 0.03 in the abundance by number compared with the BBN prediction. So that's, uh, that looks pretty good. It's quite a bit different than it was, say, even five years ago, uh, where there was still quite a bit of dispersion, uh, where the, the, these points really did not look like this at all. So um, that's quite amazing. Uh, this is, again, the prediction, uh, and if you use that observed abundance, this is what you would say where you would be sitting from BBN, and you put that yellow bar that I had earlier from the CMB, and it sits right there. So when people talk about the agreement between BBN and the CMB, this is really what they're referring to. Deuterium abundance really comes spot on, uh, and so uh, that's very nice. Uh, helium abundance. So helium abundance is something that uh, I worked on with Gary quite a bit, uh, at least in, again, in somewhat early days. Uh, actually with Terry, this was the first paper that we did that on specifically the helium abundance and the data and the analysis of the data. I think at the time we were not real thrilled with how the data was handled. Uh, it was sort of uh, chaotic. There were systematic offsets between the data and we, I think this was our first attempt to try and correct some of this. Uh, and uh, so we did this in 91, and uh, Gary and I continued on that vein, so on the abundance of primordial helium in 94, where I think we again took it one step further, and uh, then with uh, Evan Skillman, uh, Gary and I and Evan Skillman, this was now 96, 97, uh, where actually here we were even using some unpublished data that, uh, that Skillman provided. Uh, to try and really do a more systematic uh, estimate of what the helium abundance uh, in the data uh, would give. And that really sparked a lot of my later work with Evan on the helium abundance. And the point is here, um, and this is work with Evan and my student Eric Aver, you have a model for the helium abundance, which I don't want to go into in detail, but basically you have a model, depending on the helium abundance, which tells you what the flux of these observed lines are. And the data, so there's a lot of data, there's, uh, over 100 uh, of these extragalactic H2 regions which you can get a, an abundance out of, but they're not all equally good, and whether it's the data that's not good or the model that's not good, we don't know, but some of the data looks like this if you, if you try and fit a chi-squared to, uh, so you, you're predicting a, a fluxes and you can uh, compare them to measured fluxes, and I mean this is, just doesn't give you any information right, on the helium abundance. Some of the other data is really quite good, and you do get a very accurate uh, abundance of, of helium in a particular object. Uh, and you put that all together, really only a fraction of the data allows you to get what that helium abundance is. And our current best estimate of that is just under 25%, 24.5% with an error of about uh, 0.004. A lot of the er reduction in the error that, that we came about was because of the addition by Izetov, Tuan, and their collaborators of adding a, um, um, an IR line uh, at the wavelength of 10, 830. Okay. So you see, without that line, the error was almost uh, over double. Uh, so again, I said this, this was a picture from, uh, I think this was the, the 65th that was here uh, in, in, uh, in 2008. Gary and I would have a lot of fights about uh, helium abundance. I'm certainly telling him something he didn't like so much at the, at, in this picture, although uh, we got along well enough that uh, uh, in the next picture he seemed to, I'm still not so sure that he gets it, but, but Gary's, Gary's, uh, Gary, yeah, well, Gary uh, seemed happy at that point, so uh, we left it on a good note. Uh, 
Yeah, Gary and I, uh, I'm very happy that, you know, we stayed in, in good relations through, through disputes and uh, all the way through, uh, uh, through the end. Uh, we actually, I was hoping he was going to come to Minneapolis in, in May of this year, and of course, uh, he wasn't able to make that. Moving on the last few minutes to, to lithium. Uh, lithium is not the, the, the grand success of uh, nucleosynthesis. Uh, the BBN predicts uh, an abundance which is too high relative to the data that's seen in these, uh, in these same stars. Uh, and here's another way of looking at it. If you blow up lithium, um, if you, there were new cross-section measurements, everything you can do, and I, this, this could be a talk. And in fact, this I think was the talk I gave at Gary's uh, fest in, uh, in, 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 in 08, talking about the lithium problems. Uh, but you know, in the end, uh, everything we've tried hasn't worked, but maybe it's depletion is the answer, and that's something that Gary uh, and Mark Pensano uh, uh, and Terry worked on here at Ohio State. Uh, maybe that's what's going on. Maybe the, 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 uh, the lithium is just destroyed in these stars, uh, and you shouldn't get the right answer. Uh, uh, so how do things look? Well, you can, uh, Gary was another big proponent of, uh, of combining BBN and the microwave background, that is to do a combined likelihood analysis. And I think he really started the discussion in this, uh, in this vein, and that's what we're doing now. Uh, so this is from work from a couple of years ago with uh, Brian Fields and uh, Rich Seibert and a student of, of Brian's at Illinois. And here you see the concordance of, uh, of uh, BBN with the observations. Uh, helium, there's still the big errors. Um, uh, the, uh, the gray region here is actually a, a CMB uh, determined uh, abundance of, uh, of helium-4. So it's actually getting competitive with the uh, observational abundances, which is, uh, which is that yellow. Of course, the BBN prediction is the, is the dark blue. Deuterium, great agreement. Uh, uh, helium-3, well, we don't know how to make the comparison, and lithium, not, not so great agreement. Uh, and so that's where things stand on that. Um, and then I'm just going to finish up here. There's just some uh, ways of looking at how BBN and the CMB are comparing with each other. This doesn't use BBN. This is just a pure CMB determination of of the uh, of the helium abundance, so it's 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 not great, but it's not terrible either. So there's no BBN information, and just for reference, the BBN, the thickness of this is three sigma uh, from from BBN. Uh, and this is again uh, telling you what the uh, what the helium what the baryon uh, the photon ratio is using different uh, inputs, whether it's uh, uh, just uh, BBN and, and the helium abundance, which is very broad, or getting uh, deuterium, of course, is much better. And of course, the CMB, which tells you what the baryon density is to a much higher accuracy, is best. And then, of course, if you combine them, it gets even better. And here's a table. You don't have to worry about it now. But it, the, no matter what you're using, so long as you start getting in the CMB, the numbers are very convergent for the baryon to photon ratio, which is why I said it's not really a parameter anymore. And it, you can also use it to fix the number of neutrino flavors if you want to open that up again. Uh, but that number is right around three, certainly consistent with three. Uh, an upper limit now, uh, Gary always liked the upper limit on the number of neutrino flavors. I, I think we would say it's about 3.2 right now. And again, going back to some of those early plots that Gary did, this is just the abundances of the light elements and its sensitivity to the number of neutrino flavors. So what he pioneered is something that we still do and are still interested in. Uh, 40 years later. Um, this is again the CMB determination of 8 and, and, and nu without BBN and when you put in BBN things get a lot better and uh, certainly I think look, look pretty good. Again, modulo the, the issues with lithium-7. So I think I'm at the end. Uh, Gary was certainly a pioneer of modern uh, BBN. I, so you had the really early work of uh, Gamow and and, and his group, and then of course, then you had the Wagner and Wagner, Fowler, and Hoyle, and Peebles, which sort of that intermediate that really got the numerical calculation started. But uh, Gary was in there from the beginning, and the methods and techniques that that uh, I really say he pioneered are, are what we still use today. Uh, I learned a lot from my interactions and cal uh, collaborations with Gary, and uh, as well as with with Dave, who we we all miss. 
and with Mike and Terry from those early days uh, at Chicago and beyond. And I will miss him, uh, as we all will. Questions for Keith? I see no cards.